Good morning. morning. Well, last time we got through chapter 16. Did you did you make it through three chapters this morning? This morning. Wow, you're you're moving along faster than I'm moving through the Book of Acts. So this is oh this is. Okay. <laughs> got you. So what? Uh, I like the way you do it. <laughs> so we. Uh, we're only on to, we're to chapter 17, and this is part 20, so that tells you something, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so we're moving along a little more slowly. But uh, I guess that's okay. That gives us more material for future uh, reference here, future studies. So last time we, finished, we did finish chapter 16, <clears throat> and there we saw that Paul and Silas had established a, a church in Philippi. Uh, he was now. Now he's you know he's been in Asia Minor, began in Antioch, uh, in Syria, moved on through Asia Minor, establishing churches there, and now he's uh, he's on European so soil, and a church was established in uh, Philippi. And this is a this uh, the best we can tell occurs in somewhere about 49 to 50 A.D. <coughs> now. Uh, he visited on two other occasions, that was in 56 and 57, and uh, the epistle to the uh, Philippians is dated about 61 to 62 to give you some references to the time frame we're looking at, looking at here. So let's take it up, uh, take up the account there in uh, uh, chapter 17 where Paul now, as we saw last time, has left. Uh, he he uh, He's moved on now from Philippi and is headed toward Thessalonica. That's going to be his next stop. Verse 17, now when they had passed through uh, Amphipolis, uh, Amphipolis, Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. Now, Amphipolis was some 30 miles from Philippi, so that kind of gives you an idea of the uh, uh, knowing that they didn't have their, you know, couldn't jump in their RAV4 Toyota back then uh, and drive over uh, a mere uh, 30 miles away. It, it took some time to move from one place to another. So there they are. They moved through Amphipolis from Philippi, that's 30 miles, and then uh, from, from Amphipolis, Amphipolis to Apollonia, that's another 25 miles. And now then they only have 40 miles to go before they're through at Thessalonica. So they wind up in Thessalonica, which is 40 miles from Apollonia. Uh, and it says where there was a synagogue of the Jews. It's Paul's custom to, you know, as he says elsewhere, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He goes into the synagogue first when there's a synagogue in a particular city. And he preaches to the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, the God-fearing Gentiles who are among them. And uh, then he moves out into the broader community. <clears throat> Verse 2, And Paul went in, as his custom was, he was still, keep in mind, he was an observant Jew. He hadn't abandoned anything as far as his uh, Jewish identity was concerned. As his custom was, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the Scriptures. Now, are, was he there? Does this mean he was only there for three weeks? The answer to that is no. No, he, he's, he pinpoints, Luke here pinpoints these three Sabbath days because he's leading up to what those three meetings on the Sabbath uh, resulted in. But he was actually there. There's plenty of evidence. I'll refer you without turning there to Philippians chapter 4 and verse 16. Uh, which indicates that Paul was there quite a bit longer than a mere three weeks. And also, if you look at First and Second Thessalonians, Paul refers to the things that he had taught them. You look at those two books in the New Testament, you will see very plainly that there's some heavy theology there. He had taught them rather thoroughly in some uh, doctrinal matters. They say he didn't just go through, uh, proclaim a, a message of salvation, and then move on. He stayed there and he instructed them for some time. That's pretty obvious. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit more. But uh, this, this pinpoints those three Sabbath days that he reasoned with them from the, from the, from the Scriptures. Sorry, uh, Verse 3, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead. 
and, and saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. Now, they already believed that the Messiah was prophesied to come. They knew that. They were Jews. Of course, you had the God-fearing Greeks that were there as well. But this was something that was basically central to their faith, the coming of Messiah. They all knew that. Now, some, some, uh, in some uh, Jewish synagogues today, you will find they no longer believe that. But they all did back then. And they were all eager for and looking for the coming of the Messiah. So he didn't have to persuade them that Messiah was coming. They knew that. What he needed to persuade them of, that he had to die and rise from the dead. And it, it is on those two points that uh, he focused on the scriptures. And it's interesting the way this translation puts it, that uh, it says uh, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead. So they knew the Christ was coming. No problem with that. But to prove to them that he suffered and died and then rose from the dead uh, was another thing. And then he says, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Messiah. He is the Christ. So he, this, this was his message. And you see the response was pretty typical. Some, began, some wanted to hear it. Some began to believe it. Others immediately rejected it. So look at the response here. It said, and some of them, this means the Jews, were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas. As did a great many of the devout Greeks. Notice the, uh, the description here. It says some of them, some of the Jews. That kind of indicates not a great many of them. But a great many of the devout Greeks. That's the God-fearing Greeks. And not a few of the leading women. These women were probably the wives of some of the uh, city officials. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason. Now this must have happened after those three weeks of reasoning with them in the synagogues. That's why I say they st he stayed in Thessalonica longer than those three weeks. Now he's in the house of Jason. Jason. Now Jason is the Greek name for Joshua. This was without a doubt one of the diaspora Jews. And now then they no longer met in the, as it call, is called uh, earlier, in the synagogue of the Jews. Now they have their own synagogue going on. It, and oftentimes synagogues were, were in people's houses. And so here they're in the house of Jason. That's where they're now having their meetings. Uh, they don't, probably don't feel all that welcome in the synagogue of the Jews anymore. But it says they set the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. Now what do you think they had in mind? I think there's some historical context here. They've turned, they said they've turned the world upside down. Now they've come here also. And Jason has received them. And they're all acting against the decrees of Caesar. Saying that there is another king, Jesus. Now keep in mind that actually Paul was teaching that there was another king. One far greater than Caesar. And you will remember that to his, his, in his epistle to the Thessalonians... What does he say about the coming man of sin? How does he describe him? Well, he describes him as, well, the man of sin, the man of lawlessness. And he says the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Let's just turn over there and take a look at that. And get an idea of what Paul was teaching these people at that time. And he was probably, had probably been there for a, several weeks teaching the people. And as you, again, as you read 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, you realize that there's some heavy doctrinal material here, so he had to have spent some time teaching them. And he even makes a reference to uh, remembering the things that he had taught them when he was among them. In uh, chapter 2, for 2nd Thessalonians chapter 2, he says, uh, now concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by spirit or spoken word, probably meaning 
uh, someone claiming that an angel had been talking to them and telling them things about the coming of Christ, or a letter seeming to come from us, maybe from some of the enemies, some of the people that they stirred up when they were there originally, uh, say, uh, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Apparently somebody was already doing this. They were claiming that Christ had already come. Oops, you missed it. <laughs> you know. He says, let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of wor worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God proclaiming himself to be God. Now notice what he says in verse 5. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? So he must have spent some time there in teaching these things to them. But I want to call your attention to the fact that this parallels what you read in Revelation chapter 13 about the beast and the false prophet, the two beasts, one out of the sea and one from the land. And you will notice there that the beast from the sea resembles very much the dragon who is described in chapter 12 and where it reveals that the dragon, the seven-headed, ten-horned dragon, is Satan the devil. And this beast that comes out of the sea looks like him. And it's very clear, I've talked about this before and I'm not going to go into any depth here, but it's very clear as you read the description of that beast, and I've said before that the people who first received the revelation were not scratching their heads and saying, what in the world could this possibly mean? They automatically knew that it was, in their day, imperial Rome. And that second beast that came up out of the earth, the two-horned beast, that was the imperial cult, a priesthood that enforced worship of the emperor. You know, these, uh, the emperors claimed, the Roman emperors claimed that when they died, they took their place uh, in the heavenlies with the gods, among the gods. They, were, they became gods. They were deified upon death. But the time came when the emperors decided, no, I'm not going to wait till I die. I want to take advantage of that while I'm still alive. So then they started claiming to be gods while they were still alive and demanding some kind of uh, expression of worship toward them. And the, the original readers of Revelation understood uh, that that beast was exactly that man of lawlessness. The Roman Empire with someone at the head claiming to have this kind of this godlike ability and, and demanded their worship or such obedience that they would uh, you know put it ahead of anything else that they might worship in their lives. So when it says here back in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 I think it's pretty clear he's talking about the same thing. So what was Paul referring to when he talked about the man of lawlessness? Of course, he's, he's thinking of end times. There will be a manifestation of this same power in the time of the end, in our future. But uh, here there, there, he says the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. What do you think he had in mind? Certainly by the time you get to the book of Revelation, you can see what that man of lawlessness, what that mystery of lawlessness was, where, it, where there was a manifestation of that power, and that was in Rome. And so Paul was, in effect, teaching, he may, maybe not directly, but he was, in effect, saying that there is another king besides that antichrist man of lawlessness in Rome. So there was a tr there's some truth to that. However, he was not saying you need to rise up now and become politically active or anything like that. No, no. He, was, he taught, as Jesus did, that his kingdom, God's kingdom, is not of this world. It's not of this age. It's not yet. It's for the future. So the Romans would have been well advised to understand the Christians were no threat to them. But there were certain voices out there who would have the Romans think that they were, in fact, a threat to them. But here Paul talks about this man of sin. And he, say, he, tells, he tells the Thessalonians that, uh, the, well, the mystery of iniquity is already, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Now where it says here that uh, he, takes his seat, he takes his seat in the temple of God, for this reason, some people believe that uh, a temple will be rebuilt uh, toward the end time. And this uh, man of lawlessness, when he reveals himself, the 
final manifestation of it, uh, he will take his seat in the temple of God. Now, whether that turns out that way, I don't know. Uh, maybe it will. But I tend to think this is uh, Paul is speaking in figurative language here. Uh, just as the emperors, the Roman emperors, claimed to take their place among the gods upon death, now then you have Roman emperors who are claiming to already have taken their place among the gods, already seeking the worship that will be due to them after death when in fact they're still alive. So I think he's just speaking figuratively and possibly even in reference to that. But in any case, in any case, Paul was teaching another king other than Caesar, but he was not teaching uh, a rebellion or anything like that. Now back to the back to uh, back to our subject. Back to uh, chapter 17. Verse 8, And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. Now what do you, again I ask the question, it says they have turned the world upside down. What do you think they had in mind? There was an event that took place anciently. It's mentioned in chapter 18. We'll look at it a little more closely then perhaps. But uh, it, there was something that happened. They probably, the people there had probably heard about the expulsion of the Jews from Rome at the edict of Claudius, the Emperor Claudius. And that took place in about 49 to 50. So they would be familiar with that. Now why did he expel the Jews from Rome? Well, the blame went to something called, in the ancient writings, Christus. What do you think that was? No doubt a reference to Christ. So they heard about the preachers of Christ in Rome stirring up the Jews, and it caused so much, it, it caused so much problem that Claudius finally issued a decree expelling the Jews from Rome. And so here these people in Thessalonica were saying, this is coming to us. These people have already been turning the world upside down. Now they've come here. So they were concerned about that happening to them. That's why they mention here uh, the decrees of Caesar. Because they knew Caesar could do the same thing to them and their community that he did in Rome. So that's probably what he has in mind here. Let's continue on with the... Uh, Verse 9, and when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. Now, what was that about? Well, the officials probably, this is the probable meaning is that they made Jason and the others say they couldn't find Paul. He was not there. They may have assumed he was already gone. But in any case, they made Jason and the others post a bond, probably as a security that Paul and Silas uh, who couldn't be found at that point, would not come back to the city until after their deaths, or their, they were no longer in office. So they didn't want them around, so they made them pay. So this is why you read in verse 10, I believe, it says, the brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. Now this was some 45 to 50 miles away. And when they arrived, they went, here, here again, these troublemakers, <laughs> they went into the Jewish synagogue. But this, something interesting happens here. It's a little bit different from Thessalonica. You would think you'd see it run into the same thing wherever they went into the Jewish synagogues, but not here. Now these Jews, verse 11, were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily, not just on the Sabbath, when they, the law and the prophets were read and there was some kind of exposition went on, but examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. That's a very different attitude. And you know the Bereans set an example for the church, for all of us, and for the church down through history. Many of them therefore believed with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. So here, once again, you see the same pattern. You see believers coming from among the Jews and also the God-fearing Gentiles who were there worshiping with them and hearing the words of Scripture and hearing Paul expound uh, the gospel. But then there were problems. You would think that 45 or 50 miles away from Thessalonica would be far enough 
uh, to not have those Thessalonian troublemakers to, prob to, to be a problem to you, but that wasn't far enough. It says in verse 13, But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea also, they came there too, agitating and stirring up the crowds. When the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea, but Silas and Timothy remained there. You see, Paul was the one looked upon as the chief troublemaker. He's the one that doing most of the talking, most of the exposition, the explaining, the proving from Scripture, all of these things. And so, get rid of him, and uh, I guess they, they perceived that uh, leave Silas and Timothy behind, that's not that big a problem. They're not, they, don't, they're, they don't have the big mouth that Paul had. Those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens. Now we come to another place, a very interesting place here. Uh, I've, I've always liked this section of Scripture because there's, it addresses so many things. Uh, I've used it uh, in addressing Calvinism. I've used it in addressing uh, uh, the nature of God and other things here. But they came as far as Athens, and after receiving a command, uh, receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. So it, it was at this time, this particular time in history, that Athens was no longer uh, the, uh, the important political uh, area that it had been at one point. But now it had become the, 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 the city known for, its, for the universities, for the place of learning. And this is where the philosophers gathered. You're familiar with the Greek philosophers. You're familiar with names such as Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. All of their teachings, they lived hundreds of years earlier, but all of their teachings were basically concentrated there. And they, these men, Plato, Aristotle, Aristotle, Socrates, and many others, influenced philo philosophy for ages to come. Uh, they were known as the intellectuals of the day kind of a move away from the uh, typical crass paganism that you see all around. But uh, the philosophers, the, the intellectuals, uh, the ones who thought deeply about things and then they expounded their so A lot of it was mumbo jumbo, but nevertheless, nevertheless, uh, uh, they, it was a step in many regards, a step in the right direction. Some of them by sheer logic, by reason, concluded that there had to be a first cause. That is to say, a creator. So they came to that conclusion just through reason alone. Alone, uh, Others came to different conclusions, but nevertheless, this was the center of learning now and the center of philosophy. So Paul is going to encounter some philosophers while he's there. Verse 16, Now while Paul was awaiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. Still the observant Jew that he'd always been. He grew up with that. That's the kind of thing was just absolutely repugnant to him. Uh, it wasn't to the people who were used to it. Uh, the, the philosophers who were there, uh, they, didn't, they didn't necessarily believe in such things, but nevertheless, they were accustomed to it. But here Paul was just, uh, he found these things repugnant. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, that's again the God-fearing Gentiles, and in the marketplace every day with those who happen to be there. Now this is interesting. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. So here he encounters the philosophers. And now who were the Epicureans? Well, Epicurus lived in 342 to 270 BC, hundreds of years earlier than this particular time. And uh, he believed that the purpose of life was, well, to seek pleasure. You do that by seeking freedom from pain, from fear, and passions. That's a pretty good philosophy, isn't it? And then you had the, uh, the other group there, the Stoics. You may have heard of Stoic expressions and Stoic calm and words like that before. Well, that comes, that's a, a good reason from that. This, the Stoics, uh, there's a fellow named Zeno who was uh, the chief Stoic philosopher. Now, the, all of these philosophers, he lived in, uh, from 340 to 265 B.C. 
But all of these, these philosophers from that period, hundreds of years earlier, actually drew and their philosophy or aspects of their philosophy uh, from other philosophers before them, and they developed it and expanded it and came up with new concepts and so on. But the name Zeno uh, is uh, the name associated with the school of philosophy known as uh, Stoicism. So they believed, their, their philosophy went something like this. They believed, of course, in the primacy of reason. They emphasized reason. But they also emphasized living in harmony with nature, uh, with uh, the use of self-sufficient things, such as reason and other, thing, other things that, uh, you know, for self-sufficiency. Um, they also emphasized virtue great emphasis on not allowing your emotions to rule you. Emphasis on, for example, not uh, uh, anger, things that we normally do, you know, things that, things that provoke anger, uh, or not letting your passions, your emotions rule you. And this is the word, the expression stoic calm that you may have heard. Uh, that's, or at least they heard it in those days. And that uh, had to do with the fact that sometimes you could say anything you wanted to do or you know, all kinds of situations that would normally provoke all sorts of emotions out of people. The Stoics were just kind of calm. You know, no emotional response. They probably greeted each other by saying, live long and prosper. <laughs> but uh, that's, that's the way they were. I want, I've wondered if that character, Spock on Star Trek, if they drew... If they drew some of those uh, that you know from Stoic philosophy, because they act like a bunch of Stoic, they, or I should say, the Stoics acted like a bunch of Vulcans, <laughs> <laughs> and they had a concept of God as well. But it was a uh, well, more or less a pantheism, God being one with nature, uh, or God is the same as nature. Uh, they had some kind of t expression such as God being the, the world soul or some kind of mumbo jumbo philosophical nonsense like that. Nevertheless, they at least had, they were, it was a movement in the right direction, away from the uh, pantheon of gods to the, uh, the concept of a single one God, even though this, this God was kind of at one with nature or was nature itself at the same time. But, but you had a lot of very positive things in this. Emphasis on on, uh, you know, goodness, kindness to others, mercy, justice, all of those things, being a just person and a, and a humble person, all very good, uh, it's a very good philosophy on a number of, uh, in a number of, uh, for a number of reasons. So continuing on here, so some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? That's a derogatory term. It means scrap collector. In other words, hearing him talk sounds like he's gone from here to here to here, collecting all these religious and philosophical scraps and putting them all together and forming his own scrap heap. heap. <laughs> so what does this scrap collector, this babbler, wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities or deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. That's something they, they weren't familiar with. Now keep in mind now, he's not in the synagogue here. This is something very different from the synagogue environment. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, which means Mars Hill. And this, is, this was the site where there had been great council meetings and all of that held in uh, times past. Saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. Why would, they be, why would they wish to know? Because that's what they did. <laughs> that's what they did. Hear a new teaching. Oh, we want to learn about that. For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. Church can become that way after a while, can it? In some, some places, sometimes it can. Uh, where if you know it's nothing new, well, you know, well, let's get something new. Well, there's some people like to hear something new all the time. And that's the way the whole city apparently was. 
Again, like I said, Paul is not in a synagogue here. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. Now, I want you to recall how Paul says elsewhere that he's all things to all men. He knows how to be very Jewish because he grew up with that. He was trained at the, at the feet of the greatest Jewish scholars of the time. Uh, he was, uh, also knew how to, be, uh, to, to behave as the Greek philosophers because he was an educated man. Do you understand, are you beginning to understand why God selected this man, this particular Jewish scholar, to be sent to Gentiles? I've asked, I raised that question in one of the previous studies. I asked, why would he choose a man like that? A man who sat at the feet of Gamaliel. You know, a man who probably knew several languages. He could speak Greek, he could speak Hebrew, he could speak maybe other languages. Uh, certainly, certainly knowledgeable of the scriptures. Very knowledgeable. Why would he choose him to send him to, into the Greek world as Jewish as he was? Well, I think you're beginning to kind of see the picture here. Uh, I think he would work a little better than the Galilean fishermen. At the Areopagus, Greek philosophers, yeah, you need an educated guy. You need somebody who understands them and can meet them on their turf, as it were. And you're going to see Paul doing that very thing right here. And I think it's a lesson for everybody. Uh, when you meet people, you know, you don't call them a bunch of... Uh, uh, pagans. <laughs> you, don't have, you don't tell them how wrong their religion is. Look what Paul does here. He finds some common ground. And then he tells them how wrong their religion is. <laughs> but he says, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, and remember, he, was, he thought they were absolutely repugnant, I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. There is his opportunity right there. To the unknown God. He said, what therefore you worship is unknown, as unknown. In other words, you, you do this in ignorance. He's, that's not a bad term, by the way, ignorance. It's just the not knowing, not knowing, not having full knowledge. This I proclaim to you. I want to tell you about that God. The one with the inscription, the unknown God. He's unknown to you, but hey, I can tell you about him. Now, people who wanted to hear something new all the time, they were about to get an earful. And this would be something that would draw them. They would want to hear this. So I'm here to proclaim him to you. And then he does, you know, again, as I said, I've said two or three or four times, he was not in the synagogue. I mean, he was on Mars Hill talking to these people. Very different. Uh, so he's not quoting from the Torah. This is not a Torah study going on here. Tell these people, said, well, let's, let's, let's take a look at the Torah. They're going to say, the what? <laughs> you know, this, again, not the synagogue. But he does include, put some biblical teaching in here. But he does it in their terms. Watch what he does here. He says, uh, verse 24, the God who made the world and everything in it. So he's separating God from nature. Stoics. The God who made the world and everything in it, referring to the Genesis creation narrative, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. Now that would appeal to some of the philosophers of that time the Stoic philosophers and others who did believe in a first cause, does not live in temples made by man. But that does raise a question, doesn't it? What about Exodus 25 and verse 8? Well, just keep your place here. Let's take, take a look at that quickly. Does God dwell in temples? Exodus 25 Verse 8, the context is talking about uh, the sanctuary that God told Israel to make. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. He doesn't dwell in, in temples. This was a portable temple. 
Well, this kind of indicates that he does. But there's more to it than that. There's more to it than that. Turn over to 1 Kings chapter 8. And let's see what Solomon says, and let's see what he says, especially in his dedication prayer when the, uh, the temple was established. Chapter, that's 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 12, first of all. Then Solomon said, The Lord has said that he would dwell in the thick darkness. I have indeed built you an exalted house, a place for you to dwell in forever. So do God, does God dwell in houses, in temples? According to this, He does. And yet, yet, I want you to notice what Solomon says in his prayer of dedication. Verse 27, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? He asks. Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house that I have built. So what's he saying? He understands. It, you know, it's not an either or, it's a both and. God does not dwell, he doesn't live in a house or in a temple someplace. Oh, there was a special presence in the temple in Jerusalem. And God did, in that sense, dwell there. His dwelling was in the midst of Israel, uh, in the tabernacle, in the sanctuary. But, but it's also understood, Solomon here understands it, that uh, heaven of heaven itself cannot contain God. So, it's not an either or situation, it's a both and. Both and. Uh, he does dwell, he, he, he's, he's too big to be contained in a box, in a house, in a temple. Anything built with human hands. And yet he can dwell there. Guess what that tells us though? If Paul's going to lead into this here. That he can dwell in human hearts. Didn't have to leave heaven to do it. He can dwell with us have a special presence in our lives. We call that Holy Spirit, don't we? So back to the subject here. So he does, you know, Paul is right when he says he does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives, a, gives to all mankind and life and breath and everything. So here he's, he's, he's really, he's still on, he's on their turf. He's introducing biblical teaching here, but he's doing so in such a way that they will comprehend it and readily receive it. <clears throat> Verse 26, And he made from one man, or from one, some translations say one blood, from one, it's referring to one man, it's referring to Adam. And later, of course, Noah. He made from one every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. So once again, referring back to Genesis. Give them a little Bible here and they don't know it. Having determined allotted periods in the boundaries of their dwelling place, still in the Bible, Tower of Babel, that they should seek... This is, this is why. This, by the way, is why. You know, that, and I've used this passage before. Uh, after reading the Calvinist argument that uh, they get frustrated with hearing people talk about somebody seeking God. So nobody seeks God. If you're not one of the elect, nobody other than the, the elect. And that's only if God causes you to seek Him. Nobody else does it. But notice what he says here. The reason, this tells you the reason he, for the allotted periods and the boundaries of the dwelling places. It says that they should seek God. You're going to believe Paul or you're going to believe the Calvinists? <laughs> that they should seek God. And perhaps, in other words, it's still open. It's not settled. And perhaps feel their way toward Him and find Him. Yet, now this is something that would attract the philosophers. Yet, He is actually not far from each one of us. The Stoic philosophers, they kind of relate to that. For, now here's something they would be familiar with. You may not realize it, but Paul here is about to quote right out of pagan poetry. He's going to take paganism, pagan poetry, and apply it to the true God. Isn't that forbidden? Not the way he does it here. You'll understand when I, as we get through this. But first he says, for in him we live and move and have our being. That sounds like a form of panentheism in one sense, but it's not. It's true. In Him we live and move and have our being. 
they would be familiar with that statement. Why? Because the first one who said it was Epimenides, Epimenides, who lived around 600 B.C. And it says, in him we live and move. And who was the him? Well, that was Zeus when he wrote it. Zeus. But Paul is using and applying to God. Now, how can he do that if he's talking about a pagan God? He's going to take something out of paganism and apply it to the true God? Well, no, no. You see, what, what uh, Epimenides did was took something that applied to the true God and applied it to a false God. And Paul's just out, he's taking it back. He's taking it back. So in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your poets have said, and there's two of them here that have said this. There's Aratus who lived from 315 to 240 B.C. And there's also Clinthes, Clinthus, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, Clinthus, uh, who lived from 331 to 233 B.C. And it says, for we are indeed his offspring. That's the quotation. Who's the his? Again, it's Zeus in both cases. Zeus, king of the gods. And yet, Paul, knowing that it was God who created man, put man, human beings on this earth, that we're his offspring, again, this, it's misapplied when it's used in reference to Zeus. So he's taking it back and giving it to the one it truly belongs to. But the point is, he's meeting these people on their turf using language and descriptions and quotations they would be familiar with. He couldn't say, let's turn over here to you know, Deuteronomy chapter 17. They wouldn't know what that was. They wouldn't understand it. Except the, don't, unless they're in the synagogue and they were familiar with synagogue surroundings and the, the Torah and the prophets and so on. But uh, these people weren't. So he uses this language to attract them and to gain their attention. Then verse 29, being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being, the deity, is like gold or silver or stone. And guess what? You look around, you see all the what? The gold, the silver, the stone. An image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times, now this is an interesting statement here. Verse 30, the times of ignorance God overlooked. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. What in the world does he mean? First of all, the times of ignorance. We still have a lot of ignorance in the world today, don't we? But what Paul was talking about here, in, in looking at this in his context, he's looking around seeing all these idols and all these inscriptions and all these things representing a, a whole, you know, just a whole slew of uh, pagan ideas, pagan deities, and uh, obviously representing all sorts of corruption. So as he looks around there, he knows that those people, some ages past, who did all of that, did so with a, they, they, they didn't have very much knowledge. So he's saying here that God took into consideration the limitations of their knowledge about him. They were severely limited. But he says this though, but now he commands all people everywhere. What changed? What has changed? You know what it is? Hearing the word. Paul is there before these people presenting it to them. That's why he says now he's calling on people everywhere to repent. It is through the preaching of the gospel. That's what he He's taking away the ignorance that once prevailed. Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by... This is where he treads on grounds that some of them are going to immediately raise their eyebrows over. By raising him from the dead. Now if you grew up believing that uh, this material body is bad and that uh, the real goal in life is to escape this body and flee away through the heavenly spheres as an immortal soul, and that's what many of these philosophers did believe, then when you talk about resurrection, that's not going to set well with you. And it didn't set well with them, some of them. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. 
I would say that's probably the Platonists among them. But others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from the, their midst, and some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. So there you have chapter 17, and you see that even in uh, Athens, in the heart of this very deep, uh, deeply philosophical and pagan Greek culture, uh, you see converts are being made. Some people actually would hear Paul. They did want to hear about the resurrection from the dead. They would, this person he's talking about named Jesus that God would use to judge the world one day. And so a church or at least a, some kind of fellowship was established there. And Christianity continues to spread. Well, the next time we'll take up this account in chapter 18 as we continue looking at the development, the growth of the church that Jesus built.